Okay, so we now have a um, chance to discuss these two very um, interesting um, presentations from um, Stephen um, Bengt. Um, yeah, they're very different models uh, in a way, but I think the last slide really brings them to, together because I think both uh, Stephen Bengt would uh, agree with uh, research becomes valuable for teachers when it is, when it is applicable to their, to their work. You'd agree with uh, <laughs> that, I think, Steve. So I want to um, open the floor up for, for questions and comments, please. To, to either or both the presenters. We have a question here. Do we have somebody with the microphone? Would you have a very strong voice till we get her? To everyone, yeah. Subgroups, or at least, was the precision of the results considering the effect in the in the sample or in the population? Thank you. I think the main limitation at the moment is we don't have sufficient data across all the strands to do that consistently. So our decision was not to do it until we could do it more systematically. As the what you really want to do is to be able to take out all of the single studies from each of the meta-analyses and reclassify them by age and by subject and a whole series of other features and then be able to summarize the variation. At the moment, we're dependent on what regression analyses have been done within each meta-analysis. So uh, we take that information out, but we don't code it systematically, and we need to be able to do that to present those effects. Since I've started talking about the toolkit with teachers, um, they've become quite interested in the distribution. And there probably is a way we could represent the range schematically in some way, either at the second level or at the technical level. So you've got an idea of what the mean is relative to the distribution. And that's probably what we'll do next before we do subgroup effects. But yeah, you, you're right. It needs greater precision. <laughs> More questions? Rien. Uh, hello, thank you for your wonderful presentations. I, I've got a question. It was triggered by, by the student voice in the second uh, research project, but I was I want to ask it to the toolkit, what's the role of stakeholders in the toolkit? And not only teachers and school leaders, but more particularly parents, groups of parents, do they use the toolkit? Um, do you use their voice in, in uh, establishing the, the toolkit? I was wondering, could you tell us a bit more about that? Yes, it's a really good question, because when you look at, um, say, where metacognition and self-regulation is in the toolkit, engaging students in thinking about their own learning and taking responsibility for their learning is clearly one of the most effective things that you can do. Uh, again, at the moment, we have limited engagement. I, I have anecdotal stories of where parents have taken findings from the toolkit up to open days and challenged the school on what they do. That isn't terribly popular with uh, schools, but that's evidence that it is at least being used. It would be great, wouldn't it, to develop a toolkit and a view for the toolkit for students the more specifically looked at what role they could take and engage them in conversations about pedagogy and subject specific issues. Uh, all I can say there is uh, I'm 56, I've probably got 10 years working life left. I'd love to do that. I don't know if we'll get that far. I think we're picking it up a bit more in the campaigns and asking schools to do that, to share that information, particularly when they undertake inquiry. Uh, a bit like in Bank's presentation, I think that level of transparency on what you're trying to achieve with the learners themselves is very productive. 
But at the moment, I haven't got an entry in the toolkit beyond metal ignition and self-regulation that says that. So um, I've got a question for a few banks. Um, in your project, it seems to be, you know, from your quotes, lots of um, student involvement and, and energy. I wondered what your um, uh, hypothesis was about continuation, because they've, there's an enormous increase from the bottom ranking to the mm. top ranking. Do you think that will be sustained? And if, it, if so, why? And if not, how, what could be done to try and help sustain it? Mm. Well, there are two, two parts, or two ways of answering your question, I think. One is, was it sustainable in, in Esunga at lower secondary? Uh, and we haven't followed that uh, analytically as a research project. We follow the students. But we know from, from, the res from results of the characters that they are still uh, above average. But they couldn't keep this very high level. Of, and I would say that, that is natural. Uh, if you're familiar with statistics, you know something about, about regression to the mean. I mean, you, you, you probably go back. You can't get higher, and you go back some, in, in some way. So they didn't keep that top position. Uh, the, the most interesting thing is part two of that answer, and that is what happened to the students who have been involved in this. As you could see, very few of them before 2009 were eligible to go to upper secondary. And these two cohorts, every student part two were eligible, and every one of these started. They, they actually went to upper secondary. Now, each batch is very small. It's around 80 pupils. So, so it's a small population, but still, they did it, and the vast majority succeeded. So this was the, the big, I would say, the big effect, positive effect of it. Um, but what would be, you know, I can see for, for these individuals, but what would, um, and you talked about the implications for, for how research is um, communicated and disseminated, but what do you think are the broader messages from the research project for other schools? Uh, on the whole, or, or well, when you do research, you, you, your first thing you do, and that is the analysis, is to decontextualize your 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 findings. And that is to lift them up from, from the surface of, of, of this municipality and make them, in a way, possible to generalize uh, over space. And uh, if you succeed in doing that, which is questionable, some people say you can never do that when you use qualitative methods, but I mean that it's possible to, in a way, say something about what could be used in other places. And we know from practice, and I think my colleagues from Sweden can confirm that, uh, that a lot of municipal, a lot of schools have been inspired by this. And they understand that if they could do it in such a small municipality under these preconditions, doing that themselves, it would be possible even with us. So this gave them courage to do it. But, but the it is, so is it about the, it's the, the particular components of what happened in the school is what I was asking really about was generalized because you talked about several things. Was it particularly about breaking up these subgroups and? No, no it was a total and it's, of course it's difficult to, to try to synthesize this into short statements. We have written ex extensively about it, but there was a kind of, um, when you combine all, all these factors which, which made difference, it's a combination which makes the sum be much more than the plus mm. uh, parameters. Can I, can I just come in there very quickly? Because one of the things we started to work on with schools is thinking about levels of trust and challenge. And when you can create high levels of challenge with trust, then that, that's where you get people using and building on those experiences. And you could, I, that, that was what I saw in your presentation, that the, the, the students accepted the level of challenge that they were given and then took it beyond what, was, um, what, what you might have expected them to achieve. And it shows that it is possible. It doesn't show it can be generalized but it sets a very high bar for what's possible in that situation. It almost certainly would be an outlier in any meta-analysis, but that kind of isn't the point. <laughs> it shows that it's achievable. 
And I think that's that's the, yeah. the main point. It's, yeah. It encourages so many to do that, do it themselves. And we have to rely on the professionality of, of teachers and school leaders. Sometimes we try to look at them as they have to learn a lot more about other things, but they have a capability which we should not, uh, we have to be aware of that. Uh, I, I'm interested in exactly the same uh, point, really, that you, you gave emphasis to the OASIS uh, change, one very particular uh, structural change that took place, and yet the effects were across the whole uh, student population. Um, uh, is it that the, the, the way the students with special needs were in OASIS originally was just a symbol of the way of thinking uh, of not, as it were, addressing each individual's need, and that the disturbance that was introduced was a general disturbance to the way of thinking uh, that was prevailing in the school. Uh, and if you like, the effect of the intervention was not exactly behavioral, but uh, conceptual, that you, you were changing, or cognitive, that, that the way that the society that was running the school uh, changed the way, and then the consequent effect applied to all the pupils in the school rather than just the ones who had previously been at Oasis. I think they are representative for, for what was said among all these uh, students. But the interesting thing is why I choose this about the Oasis girl is that um, for the first time, 2006 actually, the, the teachers and the special well, it was a special teacher and special educators who went back to evaluate what had happened to all these kids who had been in the Oasis and other small groups during the last five years. Did they succeed? Did they go to higher um, upper secondary? And they found out that no one, 0% of these kids, were eligible to upper secondary. So that was a good reason for them to question if this was the right way of of putting in resources into something that actually didn't work. So there were such factors which all together uh, made them, uh, f they found it necessary to change. Can I, can I again, that reminds me of something that um, EEF has been working on recently around the deployment of teaching assistants within the education system. And traditionally in England, teaching assistants were deployed as general class support, and when they were used around particularly children with particular needs, it often ensured their kind of emotional and behavioral inclusion in the class, but it wasn't meeting their learning needs. In fact, children in those classes with teaching assistants assigned often did slightly worse than when there was only a class teacher. Yeah. And that a number of interventions or strategies that are put in place are very well-meaning at establishing the necessary conditions for learning, but they then to don't take it on to make sure you get the cognitive engagement and learning progress. So in the toolkit, there are a number of things around the middle, around behavioral intervention, social emotional learning, w which may well be absolutely necessary as a first step, but then they don't take on the learning to the next stage and make sure that practitioners are engaged in thinking about the learning challenge that's required to get those, to enable that progress to be made. So necessary and sufficient conditions is something I've been thinking about a lot in terms of the lessons from the toolkit. They're not there at the surface level, but as soon as you dig underneath, it becomes very apparent. More, more questions? Um, you hadn't asked a question before, so maybe you should ask first. Thank you. Um, just to make sure that I understood well, um, the lectures and the talks and the presentations that you gave um, on the project and the research, was it to um, practitioners, to teachers who were involved in the project in that area, or was it in Sweden more in general? Mm. And um, that relates to the question of the scaling up and reaching out to people who have not been involved mm. in the project itself? Uh, there were two kinds of presentations which I was talking about. One was the conferences that was arranged by the municipality. Uh, and and we, t we took part in it uh, and talked about what, 
continuously what we have found in our research. That was one part. The other is, it's been here in Denmark, in Norway, in England. We've been invited to talk about it because people have read it in, in scientific journals or whatever and knew, knew about it. So, so we've been traveling quite a lot to, to talk about this. And we have done this because we have seen it as a very big, a very important mission for us to do it. And that's part of, of this uh, more unorthodox uh, dissemination which I'm talking about. Other questions? Thank you. I have one more question about the, the toolkit, of course. <laughs> so why? So you have a scale. How strong is the evidence? So how? Why did you? First of all, question is how you established this scale, and why did you decide to actually publish the results, which where evidence is really weak, right? It's all evidence-driven, but for some cases, you, on, on, your, on your Turkey, I saw, you know, some, in some cases, it's only one on the scale of one to five. So where is the threshold when you decide, okay, this is an important topic, probably, but we don't have enough evidence to even talk about it? Because my, my reading of that is, if teachers are looking at their parents, are really regular citizens, they might be actually more interested in the, in the issue, and then they might look at the month's effect, but then the thing with the evidence, if it's one or three, it actually doesn't matter that much for them. So sometimes they might take the, the results, which where residence is actually very weak. Yeah, and we, we try and temper that in, on the second page in terms of talking about the security of the evidence. Were, the themes were identified based on what the government said schools should spend the pupil premium on, on what schools then said they were going to spend the people, people premium on and on the themes that have emerged out of our consultation with teachers. Um, uh, so that, that kind of drives the inclusion. It, when, when would we not put something in if there was absolutely no evidence? No, I think we'd say there's no evidence. Uh, and, th and that's what we'd say. If, the, if there was a reason to include something in the toolkit, We'd say that this is the state of the evidence, and that might be, where do we, where do we draw the line? Um, consistent randomized trial evidence across meta-analyses is five padlocks. Uh, one padlock at the bottom means you've got single studies and some correlational data, and it's probably not consistent. And you try and be as systematic as you can in summarizing that. But I think it's really important to say things about what, what we don't know whether or not they work Learning styles is one that gets some attention from teachers. I think most of the teachers in the UK now accept that learning styles approaches are not a good idea. But when you look at the evidence base behind them, when they have been used, there is a two-month improvement that's associated with those. When you look more scientifically, the construct or concept of learning styles, it's very weak. So we have to try and make sure that the entry reflects that. Although people think these things are, are effective, we think it's other things, self-regulation, transferring responsibility to learners, giving them choice, representation across different modes. And we try and represent the complexity of that in the entry. Because it's important to say, to say something about things that may not be effective or there isn't a lot of evidence for if teachers are likely to adopt them. Uh, a very different view from the What Works Clearinghouse. Hi. Um, I have two questions, one for each one of you. Um, for on the toolkit, I'm curious about how you deal with the publication bias so that you're more likely to have results showing a difference, whether positive or negative, published versus ones that don't show any effect, right? So you're uncovering, if you're using available data, you might be missing a whole bunch of studies that didn't show the gray, the gray literature, that didn't show any difference. Um, and the second question to you, 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 your point here that you end with, and pointing out that the incentives for particularly younger researchers who want to become tenured in faculty are basically at odds with a, a research dissemination model. Um, you also gave some examples of how local governments and schools were very interested and captivated by this example and sort of overran the town. They wanted to know more. Have you had any 
uptake of your work and your this point from the research community or from the universities themselves. So is there also a discussion about rethinking the kinds of um, the kinds of activities that would count towards tenure, for example, or promotion on the research level to include these kinds of outreach activities? Um, actually, what we have done is we have published in, in journals as well. But that was not our, our first priority. It was to, 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 to let it come out to, to, to the production. So we have um, actually, we have satisfied the, the research community as well. So the one article is published in the International Journal of Inclusive Education, one in Education Review, and there is one in the Nordic uh, uh, Journal Paideia. So, and there is one more coming. But I, I think there is, a, at least in Sweden, I think you have the same problems, in, or problems in more, same situation in most countries, is that you, you have the pressure on you as a, as a young researcher is both to, to be part of the faculty, I mean, be successful, but also, and that's even worse, uh, that you have to contribute to the, the wealth of, of, of the faculty and the university in terms of, of money. Uh, in, in, in my, university, my university, this is very, very important and it's stressed all the time that you have to do it. And I think, of course, you have to, to do it, but uh, you don't have it to do it as first thing. That's my, that's my mission. Oh, you, oh, sorry. You mean due to, to what, to how we did? Oh, any kind of, just some kind of open discussion? Yes, we have had that discussion, at least at my department, about how do we, I don't know if it has been discussed in the, uh, the, the, the university level centrally, but we have discussed it a lot. And we are fenced, we are trapped in this uh, system, so, so it's very difficult to, to not do it. Mm, publication bias, a really interesting question. More than happy to talk about it at length later, but we deal with it in a couple of ways in the toolkit. One is we look at um, whether or not publication bias is included and addressed in each of the meta-analyses, so that's coded for when we look at the meta-analyses. The other one is a much trickier question, because I think you're right, I think there's probably systematic publication bias for all kinds of reasons across the educational landscape. If you look at the typical effects, the association between effect, or at least the inverse association between effect size and sample size, there's clearly something going on of which publication bias is problematic. Um, my overall take is that research studies probably, and meta-analyses in particular, tend to optimize rather than typify the effects that a school is likely to find if they adopt that approach. So the toolkit is probably over-optimistic in what would be achieved by a school or achieved if you scaled something up across a system, because we know that scaled up studies tend to get smaller effect sizes, and part of the reason for that will be publication bias in the field, but Partly it'll be super realization bias and the other problems with scale up. That's one of the reasons why I think the overall framework of the toolkit is so important because it gives you a relative value. Do I really believe that if a school, you know, 100 schools um, implement feedback more effectively, that the average impact will be eight months? I, I don't know. It's kind of the best guess we've got at the moment, but I think it's better knowing that and that feedback and metacognition and self-regulation are good bets, whereas school uniform or changing the length of lessons are bad bets or risky bets, then that's the kind of relative information schools need to know. So that's my, I suppose, post hoc justification for what's clearly a weakness, but that's not just the toolkit, that would be true of any meta-analysis. Thank you. Uh, could you say something about, this is about communication, about evidence-based uh, knowledge. Could you say something about communication bias? Mm, don't we see, don't we have a responsibility to mm, not over-exaggerating mm, the evidence we find before they have been tested in 
uh, for example, inclusion in Danish schools. So, um, it's a big issue in Denmark right now. Uh, absolutely, and, and that's partly why the toolkit tries to be as transparent as it can and puts the emphasis on professional decision making rather than providing solutions. And why I stick to the idea that you're better off understanding the average and the distribution than putting too much weight on a single study. But, but I think the conclusions are different because I actually really like bank study because it shows it's possible. It doesn't show it's the, necessarily the optimal way to do it or the way that everyone should do it. It just gives a vision and if teachers buy into that vision and try and achieve the same for their school, then that's a good thing. I, I go for best bets on average. He's going for exceptional, but I'll, I'll let him finish answering the question. <laughs> well, I think that's a very important question you raise here because uh, of course you get, um, there is a risk that you overemphasize uh, what you find and, and you have to deal with that tricky issue all the time. In our case, we had actually a senior advisor in the project coming from England with experiences from Birmingham, uh, we could always discuss these things because you get so contextually involved when you are so close to, to, to the place where you make the research. So we have been very aware of this and we have been very, 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 uh, it has been very important for us not to say anything about uh, causal uh, effects, to say that this was the cause of, of inclusion, for example. You couldn't say that. But there was a strong correlation between the success and the structure of, of the change. That's, we can say that. Do the policy makers understand? Mm, that's a good question as well. more, not scientifically, but more easy read In my experience, Policymakers are usually looking for evidence post hoc mm. to defend a policy or an idea mm. rather than trying to generate policy on the basis of evidence. But it may be I'm just getting a bit old and cynical. Uh, I'd love to have a discussion about, you know, with policymakers about what I think the evidence suggests would be areas to explore for policymaking. But it's almost always they want evidence or they'll challenge the toolkit. I've had a uh, a direct challenge from a minister about something in the toolkit because it doesn't fit with what the government thinks ought to work. But yeah, it, that's really challenging. I just think they're different worlds and we have to be aware they're different worlds. We communicate differently. <laughs> well, we've been invited actually to four of the political parties in, in Sweden to, to talk about these. And I agree, I think they wanted to get confirmation of what they already knew, which was not the case. They didn't. They didn't get the confirmation, I think. But, but so there has been a communication at all, at least, but I don't know how it has, yeah, what I, has happened. Yeah, I, I wouldn't want to be, I mean, too negative in the, in the sense that I, I don't think that dialogue is absolutely essential. It's really important that we keep the dialogue open between policy practice and research. I just think we have different goals and ends and different kind of warrants, different tests for truth and argumentation that we just have to be aware of when we're working in different fields. Otherwise, you just miscommunicate. <laughs> so um, we've come, we come to the end of, the t of our time, which I think is a really interesting discussion, two very quite uh, different but overlapping approaches to, to, to these issues, particularly focused on practice. But uh, I think we should have toolkits for policymakers too, but <laughs> we can discuss that. Maybe much, too, not in your lifetime, Steve. So um, uh, I think we just would like to, uh, to, to thank both speakers for a very interesting uh, uh, session this afternoon. Thank you very much.